Bam. This is Siri Lindley, and you are watching the Break It Down show. I keep wanting to throw the S in there or drop the L. I think Lindy, Lindsay, I'm like, oh, it's Siri Lindley. And uh, it's a little bit of a, a tongue twister for what you want to say. But welcome to the show. Either way, I love it. I'm so thrilled to be here, Pete. We're going to have an awesome time. So thank you for having me. Yeah, you're a kick in the pants. I read all your bios, and it's just like life through things. Look, we're basically the same age. I'm born in January of 70. You're just a few months before me. And so we've lived a very similar life, right? I don't know how long you've been in California, but I've, I've primarily lived in California, except for professionally. I've lived in other places. And I'm just curious uh, about your upbringing and how those things started. I don't want to spend 10 minutes on this, but just brush over like the beginning so we kind of get an idea of – what kind of Gen X are you? So I actually just moved out to California. So we've been out here for a month and a half. Um, I was born in Greenwich, Connecticut, East Coast girl, went to Brown University, lived in Massachusetts, did, you know, did some coaching at Princeton University and Lehigh University. So I was East Coast okay. all the way until I moved out to Colorado and obviously traveled the world as a professional triathlete, but I am here in California and I am loving it. So you now have a new neighbor. Well, we have this crazy uh, weather this year, all this rain that we had, you know, uh, six months prior. And now we just can't seem to get the sunshine turned on sustainably. So hang in there. It's going to okay. get even better. <laughs> we had a beautiful sunny day today. And the thing for us, we rescue horses so hay is very important, obviously, to feed our horses. So that rain that you all got that I did not witness because I wasn't here yet was a total godsend because mm. now there's plenty of hay for our horses. So we're grateful that you withstood all that <laughs> rain so that we could benefit from it. No, yeah, that's great. Yeah. The rain thing is amazing, and and we're also fortunate. Uh, I guess let, let's spend some time talking about your your horse ranch, and because it's a very special thing in and of itself, and I don't want to uh, not bring that up. So let's cover that right now, and talk about it, and then we'll go from there. And I'll put a link up to the website if you guys want to look into into what Siri does, and so that'll be down below here just in a moment. Well, that's awesome. So basically. Only seven years ago, I rescued a horse, and it was very random how I ended up rescuing a horse. But this horse that you can see over my shoulder, Savannah, she was on the road to slaughter. 60,000 horses a year are slaughtered for human consumption, and it's wow. the most horrific practice. They're dismembered alive. It's it's horrible. Anyways, I didn't know this at the time, but I saved this horse, and this horse changed my life in a matter of months, like showed me a bravery and a courage inside of me I could have never thought could exist inside of me. And so one day after about three months, I thought, why did I, what did I rescue her from? And that's when I got online mm. and I saw this video of what was happening. And that night I got on legal zoom and I created believe ranch and rescue the next day, my wife and I saved five horses from slaughter and since then, seven years ago, we've rescued 265 horses from slaughter, most of whom have gone on to heal humans through equine therapy. We run events at least twice a month uh, for people with anxiety, addiction, PTSD, uh, neurodiverse kids, people facing, you know, pretty terrible diagnoses. And it's just so beautiful to see this whole thing come full circle. Um, but it's my hobby, believe it or not. So <laughs> I didn't really have time to take this on. I didn't really have the bandwidth to take this on, but I couldn't say no to it. And it actually feels like a really beautiful privilege uh, to be a voice for them. Who knew? Who, who knew you'd be in this spot? It's crazy. I couldn't have... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a story. I don't know why this is coming up, Pete, but I had this cat years ago, like in, in the year 2002, I had a cat that was like my soulmate cat and she ended up passing and I was absolutely devastated. I was so devastated that I called an animal um, communicator because I wanted to know when am I going to see my cat again? And I'll never forget the animal communicator said, well, she needs a break, but she's coming back as a horse. 
And I said, oh, great. A horse. When am I ever going to have a horse? Like, that's the most ridiculous thing ever. And I remember being kind of, you know, pissed off in a way because I thought, but I want to see her again. And that's ridiculous. And then what was it? You know, 18 years later, um, I meet my horse and now we're surrounded by them. So there's definitely something to that, you guys. I, I don't know that I was a believer before, but I'm definitely convinced now. If it is true, it is not the craziest thing in the world that right. that there is some kind of connection and that, look, this religion versus that religion and who gets it more right. It absolutely wouldn't surprise me at all to find out, oh, yeah. You know, your animal is always your animal. You all, you know, they rotate through and and throughout your life, you know, and it's all part of the whole cycle of kindness and caring. Or that wouldn't in any way surprise me if we figured that out tomorrow with some new equation or something. It would just be like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I love that, Pete. I love yes. that as a, as a <laughs> new religion or and and sometimes I think it's you know just whatever you believe in is what you believe in. And that works. As long as you believe in it, that's going to support you and um, be a, a sense of, I don't know. And, and so I love that. I love that idea. And I'm all in. <laughs> good, good, good. And I wanted to go back and cover, you talked about um, the uh, equine therapy. And I, I'm a veteran PTSD. Yeah. And I, I deal with that stuff through my own version of therapy. But we all have our things that we're looking for and if it's veterans it's athletes it's police people fire people but all kinds of people have to deal with ptsd we're finding more and more about like you know how you train your body right like you're, you're a triathlete when you train your body a certain way it responds naturally to things that i could never withstand because you've built your body and trained it it's the same thing with these traumatic events and so equine bovine therapy there's a guy here i put his link up marvin frank he was, he realized he could talk to cows. He's a veteran and he started getting better. And it, it's amazing. It's amazing that all these people do this. One, you are saving these horses on the front end. I had no idea we sold so much horse meat overseas. I had no idea that people are being, because there's a market for it. As I was on your site reading about it, I had no idea people were being almost tricked into, into doing something they wouldn't normally do. And it just look, I had no problem with people in other countries eating horse meat. But let's be honest and open about it. Let's understand it. And, and like your site says, you know, our horse meat is treated differently because it's not intended for human consumption. Right. Well, first of all, Pete, first, let me start by saying thank you for your service. I can't even express to you, especially happy Memorial Day. Um, I celebrate you not just on that day, but every single day for your service, for, you know, just doing so much for all of us. It is uh, something I think about all the time. And and veterans, you know, the programs, and like I said, we just moved out here to California, but a lot of our programs were for veterans that were dealing with PTSD. And to witness the healing that occurred every single time this group came to our ranch just brought me to tears. It was so beautiful. It was so powerful. And you know, we we're, we actually developed another nonprofit called Horses in Our Hands that is lobbying in D.C. to ban this practice altogether. And one of the things that I brought up was that it's something like, and, and I may not be exact on this, but every 22 minutes a veteran commits suicide because of PTSD. Every 22 minutes a horse is slaughtered for human consumption in horrific, barbaric ways. Now, the thing is that when you bring the two together, there's a beautiful healing that happens. And research has been done, so many studies have been done, and, and we're seeing this all over the country, that the benefit for veterans that are really suffering is that for the first time, maybe for some of them, they are connecting with a being that meets them exactly where they are. Yep. There is a connection that's made. It's getting them out. It's getting them out of their houses, out of their apartments. They're connecting with a being that sees them, understands them, feels them. Love it. Over yeah. week after week, 
these veterans are getting off of all the, the multiple prescription drugs, which you know all about this. So I'm preaching to the choir here, but it, it is showing itself to be one of the few things that can give a veteran, a, you know, a vision for, for what's next. You know, they, they, they have a compelling future. They're, they're coming out They're They're healing through these beautiful, magical animals. And I'm not taking responsibility for that. Like, man, you know, the horses are the healers. I'm just providing the environment. So Pete, I would love to say to you, since you're out here in California and we want to continue this work, obviously out here, please send groups our way and sure. allow us to continue this beautiful work that um, brings me to tears every time. So I guess I should say out loud to everybody that every year I go on a charity ride with Save the Brave. I'll put the link down below. We're getting ready to do that again. I'll say next month because it's in July and we're just about in June. But the end of July, like we do every year, we've done every year since 2020, uh, Scott Husing gets on his motorcycle. I follow him in my truck and we rip along the nation and people join us. They they flow in and flow out. We raise a lot of money. So if you guys want to help out, maybe you help cover some of the gas or whatever it's going to be, I'll put the link in. This is how you support. And we do things like we link up with the series of the world. We say, you know, you've got veterans there. And look, maybe horses aren't the thing for that veteran, or maybe it's a firefighter who you help, but we're just one at a time. And it's because you can't mass solve PTSD. Cortisol works through people's body and you can't just push a button. You can try to give them a pill. It might help. But what works best that we've found is putting your arms around someone and just letting them know that you're there and walking with them on this stuff. And you can't, here's the thing. There's two things I want to say, and then I'm really going to shut up and let Siri talk. You can't say to someone who's struggling, who's anywhere near a suicide, you can't say to them, hey, reach out because they're hanging on to the rope with both hands. They don't have one free to call you. You've got to call them. Call them way before they get to the end of their rope. And reach out to the people that you love. You worried about someone? Call them. Talk to them. See how they're doing. Check in with them. These things are the things that you can do now. Otherwise, expecting them to save themselves or to, to rely on you to save them at the last minute, please stop. Get way ahead of the problem. So those are my two things. So don't expect someone to reach out. You reach out and do it often way before they get to the end of the rope. Because if all it is is you have to, you and I have to drive to Santa Inez and go uh, see some horses and, and get some equine or some bovine or some wave therapy, whatever it is, we can get all those things done right there. Let's go. I'll go with you right now. So those are the things I wanted to say about okay. all of that. Pete, I second that and I love that. And so I'm reaching out to each and every one of you that may benefit from this, come. Come out here to Believe Ranch and Rescue. Pete's going to bring you. So Pete, you're going to organize it. And I want you all to come. I'm reaching out right now because I don't have your phone numbers and I can't text you and hound you and That's email right. you. Here's my invite. And I want to see you soon. You also said another thing when you were talking about the ranch. You talked about neurodiversity, which is a big thing. I, I love it. I love that in our nation, as well as a bunch of other ones, we can look at someone and say, you've got a very special set of skills. We can create an environment where you can be productive and, and give someone not only the, the ability to work and earn their own way, but make a professional living. So I'm going to put this, this thing up, this guy named Feroz. He works with an organization that focuses on that. Even if you're severely disabled across the board, but they can figure out some way for you to earn money. What an amazing country we live in where you guys can say, we're going to go lobby Congress to, to no longer export horse meat for, for food. We're going to um, look at all of these people that have Asperger's, autism, whatever it is. They're on some kind of a, a behavioral spectrum, but still have value in life because here in this country, everybody's got a shot at something. And there's probably going to be someone that's willing to walk to walk the walk with you, go down to Santa Inez or whatever it is and be like, yeah, let's go. And they'll go shake the money tree and they'll find that person who's going to help. And we all work together to make this. This is an amazing thing. Neurodiversity. The fact that we can focus on that, it blows me away. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, you know, what we witnessed there is just, it's the ultimate privilege. Like, like I said, I didn't have room for this. I didn't have the bandwidth to take all of this on, but what a gift, yeah. what a gift it's been to witness the magic of these horses with 
all these different subgroups of people that so beautifully experience it. How do you get the bandwidth to manage all this stuff? You got a book you're about to promote. We're going to talk about the book here in a minute. You know, you're a triathlete, you're a coach, you partner with Tony Robbins to do speaking. I, I am exhausted thinking about how exhausting it is. Oh, and you run a ranch. Come on. <laughs> Here's the thing, Pete, it, you know, it sounds crazy. I get that. But I actually, if I told you that I even have time in my day to go for a run and to roll on the ground with my dogs and to ride my horse, I think, and, and, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book is once you find your purpose, once you know your mission, and that sounds huge, like, oh my God, I don't know what my purpose is. What about if it's just the purpose of what do you want to feel every day? Mm -hmm. You know, I want to feel every day that I am loving with all my heart, and that means loving the people in my life, loving myself, loving what I do. I want to know that I am living fearlessly, that I'm doing things that make me uncomfortable, that I'm saying yes to things that I really want to do, but I may not be good at. And I want to know that I'm making a difference, whether it be in a human's life or in an animal's life. So for me, those are three things that make up my purpose. Because these are the things I want to feel. These are the things that I know will see me. And there's a story behind how I found this purpose that at the end of my days, I can look back and say, I lived a good life if I did these things every day. And I discovered that when I thought I may not be around the next day. So it was a beautiful gift that came out of that. But in that, so what I'm trying to say is that when you're doing something that you love, you will always find a way without it feeling like, oh my God, it's so much because it's something I get to do these things. I don't have to do these things. I get to do these things. Yep. And for me, you know, I, I'm, I consider myself a miracle in a lot of ways. I was given a 5% chance years ago, or a couple of years ago with acute myeloid leukemia. And the fact that I'm here, every breath I take is, is a miracle. And I had friends that were on the same clinical trials as me that didn't make it. But rather than live my life with survivor's guilt, I want to live my life with survivor's responsibility that I'm here and I'm here for a reason. And I am going to use every breath that I have to do good in this world and to live my life in a way that honors every single person that doesn't get to. So yeah. That's amazing. Well, I'm just, you know, so you say these things, how do you do it all? It's I get to do these things, you know, and it feels like a yeah. real privilege. It is a privilege. And, and it, I love that that's your mindset. Um, I always, so you have a very near death experience with, with cancer. Um, I've been in a head on collision with the tank among a lot of other things. And so some things just aren't scary anymore. Like, yes, I can go ask someone to be on the show. Yes. I can say yes to things that I'm uncomfortable covering on the show because it's not as scary as getting in a head on accident with a tank, you know, like that's as visceral and as real as it gets right now. My buddy, Phil, he's wheelchair bound. He's got it. He's got ALS. And, and on Friday, we're going to go to Dodger stadium because major league baseball and Phil have worked together to create Lou Gehrig day. And he is this force in, in the ALS world, but he is going to be dead in about a year, right? And so he's got to figure out how to do all the work that he's able, and he's able to do less and less work all the time, but he gets to do this. And you know what Phil said to me, Siri, and I'm going to try to say this without choking up a little bit. He said, I have an incredible life. It is amazing. I have amazing kids. I have an amazing wife. I have amazing friends. I have amazing work. The day I die, it will be a great day. <laughs> wow. I know, I know, but that's what you're talking about, right? Like, and I got a little emotional because that's what we have to keep our eye on is, is that, look, you don't have to go, there's one breath. I'm thankful for it. There's two, you know, but, but somewhere closer to that, to go, wow, I get to do these things. Yes, I have energy. I'm going to go out tonight to go with one of our friends to go see a punk rock show in Hollywood. Should I be doing that on a, 
I have so much stuff to do the next 72 hours. I shouldn't be doing this, except for I want to live. I want to do these things because you don't get to have that time back and get any credit for it. It's just gone. And you know what, Pete, you going and do that and, and doing that, like that's something that's going to fill you up, right? Something fun. You're doing it with your friends. Like it's going to fill you up. So some, sometimes we think that when we go and do things that maybe are going to take us away from whatever tasks we have to get done, we think that somehow that's going to, you know, negatively affect those tasks. But really, you go off, you do something that fills you up. You arrive at the task being more efficient, more effective, doing a much better job because you're bringing your best self to it. So what story do we tell about taking care of ourselves? Do we say that that's not allowed? It's going to lead to me not doing as good a job because if that's a story that you tell, you need to change the story. Because what I know, and I think what you know, Pete, is that when you take care of you, you can better take care of everything and everyone else in your life. So those moments where you step back and step away and do something that fills you up, to me, th that's a requirement. You must, and not just once every month, but every single day. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. We're, we're cut from the same cloth. Again, we're born almost at the exact same time, you know, not even a year apart. And so we, thanks though we've come lot. from different coasts and thanks, backgrounds. Thanks, Pete, for bringing that up and telling everyone my age. Thanks a lot. You've said it now three times. <laughs> just, it's incredible. Look how <laughs> young and, you know, fabulous we are. Come on. This is great. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being 53. Um, but you are, you're, you're 54 now, right? Ha -ha. Hey, excuse <laughs> Jeez. Okay, everyone. Cats out of the bag. No, I don't. I'm so blessed to be here. Before. I only know that because it's on the internet and it's published on yeah. one of your things. You know? so let's, let's, uh, I wanted to, there's so many great things to talk about with you. One of the things that I do every year is I go back to my high school and, and I, I talk to the students who are there. And I say, I'm you from the future. What do you want to know? Because these kids don't have the first clue. I didn't have the first clue. There's a lot more help for them now, but there's also a lot more, I'll just be unfair and say coddling, right? Like we kind of were shoved out the door, but like, have a nice day. If, try not to die, you know? And you tell your mom, I'll be back. Maybe you said, oh, I'm going to go to the mall and I'll be back. But there was no callings, there was no monitoring. And so when I talk to these kids, I think about that. And I try to think, like, how do I give them advice? Because you and I both knew, I'm like, hey, um, I'm 53 and you guys are 18. So in the next, you know, 35 years, this is some scary shit that's going to happen. It's going to be some incredible stuff. It's going to be harder. And where you end up, you're going to look back and be like, how in the hell did I end up over here? But you can do it. And, and so I try to think about how to explain these things that are unexplainable to a, a very young and developing mind, but also treat them like adults. Mm -hmm. I think that the biggest thing I would want to share, and so much of this is actually in my book, it's saying like, hey, guys, let me tell you something, that your greatest growth and how you become that person you dream of becoming is going to come out of the tough stuff. You know, like you, you can work hard and everything can go great. And yes, you're going to move forward and you'll become who you want to become. But I don't want you to be afraid of challenges. I don't want you to be afraid of failing or, you know, falling down because it's in those failures. It's in those disappointments that you will grow and you will learn. And because of what you learn and because of that growth, that leads to you becoming who you dream of becoming. So don't be afraid. And most importantly, something I've learned, I'm going to tell this to you now, because I don't want you to have to wait, you know, 40 something years to figure this out. Be you. Be fearlessly, authentically you. Some people may not like it, and that's okay, because what you'll find is you'll find your tribe. And what you'll also find is that when you are you, all of who you are, you don't leave any part of who you are on the bench. When you're all of who you are, that is where you will find your magic. That is where you will tap into your highest potential. That is where you will achieve all your dreams. So just be you.
And don't be afraid to be you. That's what I would say. And yeah. that was, I don't know. I didn't plan that. But I think those are two of the most important things. I think you're right about that. They are important things. You talked about authenticity. I'm big on this. You can't be authentic. You just have to, you know, do it. You just have to be authentic. You can't like try, right? You have to like know who you are. And you're not supposed to know who you are in the beginning. And you're also going to change who you are along the way. Most of the time, most everybody changes. And sometimes that change comes through a lot of hard work. And I want to get into swimming because I love swimming and I want to talk to you about it. But it's something like that. We're like, well, I can't swim. Adults never learn how to swim. Well, you know, maybe at open water swim. Come on, the ocean's trying to kill me all the time. That's 100% true. It's scary to do these things. And so you don't have to change. But if you start to apply these things, you find out that swimming really at some point is not a whole lot different than walking. And I'm talking like not leisure swimming. You know, it's a workout, but you and I both know you get in the pool. You don't got to go fast. You get out an hour later, whatever it is. And look, I can swim. I swim like a shitter sucker truck. I always say like, it's just ugly and sloppy. And I go across, but it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and, you know, and I don't swim two miles an hour, but pretty close, you know? And so I'm, I'm moving and I'm never feel like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to die from, you know, die from this. It's amazing to be able to do these things. And so we can't change, we can't evolve, but it takes little steps all the time and constant progress. And you do become a different person, hopefully a better person along the way. And that's what I think part of what I was reading about finding your way. It's, it's some of this stuff where you have these adversities, you have these challenges, and you do try to become the better version of you as you do it. Absolutely. And so let's talk about swimming, because I think, you know, there's something important in the story in the story I will tell you, and that is when I was 23, I discovered triathlon, which is swimming, biking, and running, and I fell in love with the sport. But the problem was that I didn't know how to swim. I didn't know how to swim. I knew how to float. I knew how to not drown, but I didn't know how to swim. And But I was in love with the sport. Now, my first race I did, I came in dead last. Humiliated myself, got laughed at, got yelled at. So a lot of times, the story that anyone, if they were in my position, could tell is, hey, I'm 23 years old. Yeah, I'm in love with this sport, but I don't know how to swim. And I just came in dead last. I guess I can't do triathlon. Triathlon's not for me. So we can choose to tell that story. And I thought about that because that it seemed like those were all the facts. But I wasn't willing to live that story because I was in love with this sport. So I had to change the story to, you know what? I am... A, a, a three-sport athlete. I'd been a field hockey, ice hockey, and lacrosse player in college. I've got great work, work ethic. I know how to work my butt off. I never, ever give up. I'm relentless, and I really want to do this. So that passion, that work ethic, that athleticism, that willingness to fail, because of those things, one day I can be the best in the world in this sport. That's the story I wanted to live. You get to choose what story you want to live, right? And think about it. If I chose the story that I'm 23, too old, can't swim, can't do what I love, I'm not going to go out and do all of the things that I needed to do to become good at it. But when I told myself this other story, that if I keep showing up and use my work ethic and discipline and relentlessness, that one day I will become that person that can be the best in the world. So that's what I did. What would she do? And then you ask yourself, like, future me, future you, the one that's going to be the best in the world, what would she do? Well, she'd get a coach. She'd learn how to swim. She'd train at four in the morning before work, during her lunch hour, after work, until dinner, go to bed, do it every single day. What else would she do? What would she believe? She would believe and she would know, actually, that if she just shows up, leans in, does the work, that every day she's going to make progress and one day she'll become good. So I think that the story that we tell is everything. And if there's something out there, listeners, that you want to do, but you're telling yourself all the reasons why you can't, like tell yourself a different story. I'm not asking you to lie. I'm asking you to look at all the things about you, the, the, the qualities or strengths that you have, that if you put them forward and lead with those things every single day that you can do what you dream of doing. 
You got to believe, but you got to tell yourself a story that's going to see you showing up in the way you need to in order to make that happen. I love it. When you pick something like triathlons, that is not a gentle thing on your body. It's, you know, it's a lot of work. And then you do become world champion. By the way, congratulations. How crazy is that, right? So you do this thing, but in your discipline, it's like, yes, I won. Oh, it feels good, you know? And then you go into standard recovery mode. And, you know, triathletes, it's not like boxing. We are like, I got all this money. I'm going to go party. I'm going to buy a bunch of CDs. I'm going to go crazy. You know, the next day you're like, I got to do a uh, recovery run, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. sort of like, so the cycle goes on. So you don't have those, look, you have peaks and everything, but you get constant, this is just me guessing, you get constant positive return on all of the other things that you didn't realize when you imagined being a world champion. You know, like I, I know for me, there's no bad hours. If I get out of the pool, I'm going to feel great afterwards. Yeah. So first of all, let me let you all know that I didn't just become a world champion. It was eight years later, eight years of training six to eight hours a day, eight years of working out when I didn't feel like it, eight years of falling on my face, and embarrassing my, well, not eight years of that, but probably two years falling on my face, embarrassing myself, lots of failures throughout the eight years, but it was consistently showing up and never giving up on my dream. And in order to make that happen from day one to eight years later, I wasn't focusing on world champion or bust, like I'll only be happy when I become a world champion. I was focusing on how every single day I was becoming a better version of me. Every single day I was proving to myself that I was brave, that I was courageous, that I could do things that scared me, that I could withstand pain, that I could push through, that I could never give up. And to go way back to when I fell in love with this sport, what I really was in a, on a search for was to find worthiness from within, a love for myself. I just found out that I was gay. And when my father found out, he was my best friend, my my greatest source of love, he found out I was gay. And that was it. I was out of his life. And that just crushed me. It was devastating to know that because of who I am, I can lose a lifetime of love from the person I love most. So I was on this desperate mission to prove to myself that even though I was gay, I was still lovable. I could love myself. I could do extraordinary things. You know, I could inspire others. But in order to do that, I needed to prove that to myself. I needed to get out there and do something that seemed impossible. I needed to get commit to something and never give up. I needed to get out there and stretch myself so that I could build up a confidence in me and a respect for me. So because I had this deep emotional reason why this really mattered to me, nothing was going to get in the way of me doing everything that I could to make it happen because it was really, it was do or die in a lot of ways. So um, I don't know why, why, sorry, I totally went off track, Pete, but hopefully that was a value. Yes, it was a value. Yes, yes. Have you and your father repaired your relationship? Yes, we have. And I, it is the most, um, so after about two years, um, he started trying to call me and I would use that as an opportunity to pick up the phone and to yell and scream at him and tell him what a horrible father he was. I would just purge all my anger, all my resentment. And eventually he'd hang up. I'd be crying and the calls came, you know, less and less. I mean, would you want to call me? It felt no. like it was rip your head off. Like you're going to stop calling too. So about 20 years later, um, I started working with Tony Robbins, um, my greatest mentor. And I was going to all of his events and it was day one at this event uh, called Date with Destiny, which is the most powerful and amazing event. And he's talking about how the people that have hurt us, if you're going to blame them, for everything that's bad in your life, you also need to blame them for everything that's good. And I started thinking about that day when he called me and said, Siri, somebody told me you're gay. 
And I thought, you know, imagine if I said, yeah, I'm gay. And he said, oh, my God, you're going to be such a fabulous gay woman. You know, what would that have done for me? Because his rejection was actually a gift because it instilled in me this absolute determination, drive, relentlessness to take on this impossible dream and do whatever it took to make it come true. Now, as I started thinking about this, I thought I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for that. And then I started thinking about, geez, what he did to me, I did to him two years later when he tried to call me, wouldn't even talk to him, just yelled and screamed, told him how horrible he is. So what was also happening parallel to that event with Tony was we had just started rescuing horses. And these horses have been like severely abused, neglected, abandoned, like treated so badly by humans. But within one week of us just loving on them, being consistent with their feed and with their water and the vet care and being kind and touching them softly, within one week, they forgive humans. And they open themselves up to love and to joy and to a beautiful future. We don't do that. I mean, humans hold on to the anger, the resentment, the pain for a lifetime sometimes. And what does that do? It disempowers us because that blame gives us an excuse as to why we're not happy, why we haven't achieved the success that we deserve, why we haven't had the deep loving relationship that we so deserve. It gives us an excuse. It disempowers us. So I'm sitting at this event with Tony and all these things are coming up. And I went outside and I picked up the phone and I called my father and he answered the phone on the first ring, which was like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm ready for this. And I said, dad, you know, you absolutely broke my heart in a million pieces when you rejected me because of who I am. And I said, but I, but I forgive you. And I also need to forgive myself but I forgive you. And I actually want to thank you. I want to thank you for being exactly the father I needed you to be, to become the woman that I am so proud to be today. My dad started crying. He said how sorry he was, how much pain he'd been in over this. He'd followed my entire career. He was so proud of me and how much he loved me. In my offering him forgiveness, I had my father back. And I also had my freedom. Now, I encourage each and every one of you to think about who you wouldn't be today if it wasn't for that person that hurt you or that situation, something you've been through that maybe you blame. Who wouldn't you be if it wasn't for that happening. Like what, think about your greatest qualities, your greatest strengths, where were they born? Were they born in the good times? Or were they born because of what happened? So no matter what, if you can find it in your heart to forgive that person or to perhaps forgive yourself, I don't want you to have the expectation that it's going to be this beautiful, happy ending and that person's going to be back in your life. You know, I feel very blessed that I have my father in my life and I talk to him every single day. I don't want you to have that expectation. But what I can tell you is that when you find that forgiveness, you become free. When you find that forgiveness, that forgiveness is for you. Mm-hmm. And you must. Because you then get your power back and you can open yourself up to all the things that you do so deserve. And that's joy and love, success and fulfillment. I love it. I, I'm going to mute your side because there's a little bit of an echo going between us. But I'm going to talk for a second here about, about what you're talking about, maybe from a different angle and then have you respond. So one of the things that I've learned is as as I've gotten older and more wiser is that grace is a good default. Like let's just extend grace and allow 
look, allow your father in this case, and, and maybe you're not capable of doing it. Okay, then, then now we have a, a distance between where we both need to be a little bit better. But, you know, as a father, my daughter turns 26 today. It's her birthday. Hi, Brenna. Happy birthday. And so I had to allow her so many problems and issues and things and be patient and graceful with her so that she could become the person she needs to be. We all need grace sometimes in time. Maybe it's just a shock, right? And I'm not trying to justify anybody's bad behavior, but when you find something new out about your kid and and it's so different than what you thought you knew, you know, that might take some time to get over. Or maybe it's just a new concept, whatever it is. The world's constantly changing socially. And we all got to give each other time because we've all been given time. And if you think, I don't have time for that person, well, then you don't have time for you, you know, because you really got to work on the you part of this. We've all been extended that grace. We've all uh, been short with our grace to other people. And so I, I think there's a real healing moment in realizing, you know what, we only have this one go around with each other and it may not work, but I'm going to do the best I can do. And, and you can't control them, but by just offering that forgiveness, you know, like my, uh, I told you I reconnected with my dad. If I wanted to, I could have held a grudge my whole life. I never met him. But I didn't. And I'm like, this is not important. What I, and this is what unlocked it for me. Then I'm going to shut up. I realized after all these years of like being on the fence, like, should I go try to contact these folks? Because I didn't know them at all. I realized, oh, my God, I, I could be someone's brother. I could be someone's uncle. And I've, this is not about my dad and I more than it's about these other people. And it opened the doorway for me to go, I need to go do this now before it is too late. Wow. Pete. Okay, you're so spot on with all of this. And I think we need to look back because it, it on the story with my father, you know, I I had known I was gay for about a year, maybe even two years. And it took a long time for me to be okay with it. Yet here, I have him on the phone. He's just found out. And because he's not okay with it in five minutes, it's heartbreaking to me. So as I look back, it's like, he just needed time. He just needed time. And for all, for the people that have hurt you, I want you to remember that we're all doing the best that we can with what we know at the time. So maybe you need to forgive yourself. Maybe there's something you need to forgive yourself for. You did the best that you could with what you knew at the time or with the skills and the tools that you had at the time. The key is that now that you know better, you do better. The key is that now that that person knows better, they do better. But like you said, grace, and I actually have a tattoo here, Pete, on my wrist that says grace. And I don't know if you can see it, but anyways. Um, grace is everything. And when we offer grace, um, it's important to look back at all the times that we were given grace as well. And to just find the compassion to understand that the person was doing the best that they could with what they knew, with the skills that they had, have grace. And remember, as you forgive, that's for you, but also it opens up so many possibilities like you, Pete, with your family. Look at what you have now. But it took you being brave enough and courageous enough to say, you know what? I don't want to hold on to this burden of this grudge. I don't want to be shackled to this pain and resentment. I want to become free. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm going to put you on mute again so I can say some things. This is great. This is what we're talking about. And what I want all of you all to do is go to the link right down here below. Look over in the comment section, wherever it is, whichever side of the screen it's in. And that's where the Amazon link is. Click that. And you know what I always say? Buddy read. So buy one for you, buy one for your friend. Maybe you've got someone you want to repair a bridge with. Why don't you use Siri's book to facilitate that? And and uh, just amplifying your point, Siri, about you know, people doing the best they have with the, you know, what they what they can with what they have at the time. And we all get to have bad days. And sometimes the bad day is like my my uh, very special someone uh dropped egg on her uh, shirt this morning and it was like Nur. and then like you drop your keys in the trash and you break your shoestring and all of a sudden you all these little tiny things turn into a bad day and then you know maybe it becomes a bad week because we all have things that happen and then you get bad news on top of that 
And maybe you don't respond well to that because you're just having a bad damn day. Or how many people are going through a divorce or some problem in their relationship that is beyond their ability to deal with the time, right? You know, we, we all have these things. That grace comes in then because we all have bad days too. It's like, you know what? That person probably had a bad day. Even if they didn't, I'm going to chalk it up to a bad day and just be thankful that I have a chance to engage with them and, and give them every chance to be awesome. And I'm going to allow myself to also be you know, full of forgiveness and grace and just say, hey, you know what? Let's just try to do this again. And, and if that's the worst day of our relationship, great. Then all the rest are going to be better than that. And that's kind of how I approach these things. By the way, it's easier said than done. It, takes, it took me a long time to get to this spot. And I'm not, I'm not a finished product by any means. I'm pretty rough around the edges still. But that's these are the things I wanted to say to what you said. Everybody buy this book. It's great. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And that's incredible advice. And yes, like we are all human. And we are going to have bad moments. I do encourage you to, you know, how you define that bad moment is, does that mean it's going to be a bad day? Because if you label it that, if you give it that meaning, it will be. You'll find evidence for that. So I encourage you to love yourself through those tough moments, to show yourself that grace, and then to say, do I want to feel more of this or less of this? Because if I want to feel less of this, let's just chop it down to it's been a bad morning, but I'm going to try and make it as good of an afternoon as I can. Um, with this book, I want to say, Pete, and I really do hope, I, I feel so certain um, that this book is going to be a real gift and a real blessing to those that read it. Um, every copy that is sold, uh, a dollar will go to Feeding America, and Tony Robbins is going to match that. So for every book sold, $2 will go to Feeding America, which will feed a family. So for those of you that do buy a book, and if you do the buddy buy as well, um, you can feel really good about the fact that you're also um, helping families in need. Uh, and yeah, Pete, I'm just so grateful to share this time with you. You're such an extraordinary soul and you, you know, your life and who you have become through your challenges, through your service, through everything that you've faced in your life. You're just this beautiful, extraordinary man. And I thank you for the good and the light and the hope that you're bringing out in the world. So um, I'm so happy that I can share this book, knowing that that's, you know, a big way that I feel I can do the same, bring that guidance, that light, that love, that hope that encouragement into people's lives. And I just thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, well, it's, it's my pleasure. One of the benefits of doing the show is I get to meet amazing people doing incredible things. And, and this is, you're no exception. You know, the cancer thing is, is just a part of who you are, right? Like we often get wrapped around this one thing that's fantastical, but the essence of it, right? I'm into the elements. Like what does it take to become a, a good swimmer, like so I can swim a mile. Because if you can swim 25 meters within a couple of weeks, you can swim a mile, no problem, right? But people get wrapped up in, I can't swim. Or are you watching swim 25 meters? And I love this. this is a BB King quote. Why are you trying so hard? <laughs> it's not a fight, right? And so you can you can take these tiny little things. Like, I can't swim at all. Can you push your legs off of a concrete wall? and go 10 feet off of the edge of the pool. I'll be there, you know, I can swim. I'll turn around and I'll shove you right back. Can you do that? Yeah, all right, well, that's not swimming, but it's a whole lot closer than you are right now. And so those little tiny steps, those day-to-day -day things, whether it's trying to be a podcaster or a pilot or whatever it is, there's just every day you're feeding that capability. And along the way you get, I don't know, 10X returns on what that is. because. The swimming is one thing, but the meditation of it and the way your body responds and the people you meet and, 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 and the next thing you know, you're just like, I love going to the pool. It's the best thing ever. And, and I'm not even lying right now. I, I haven't been in the pool for a while. I've been trying to get back in. I'm dealing with some back issues, but um, the moment I get back in, I'm going to be like, why did I spend so long away from the pool? And can, will they let me stay for two hours? Cause I'll go throw down a hundred, 150 laps. And I just like, I have to get out of the pool, but I love it. I love it so much. And if we can all find one or two or 10 of these things, the people around these things, they're so enriching. And so for me, podcasting, swimming, being out and about, helping people, being a service, these are things that I know that are true to me. 
and and uh, are good seeds to plant into the ground. And that's so beautiful. And I love that you are encouraging people to find theirs and to do those things because that's so incredibly important. And I think as adults, um, if we try something and we suck at it, we just don't try it again. And what we forget is that everything, remember, well, you may not remember, but being a baby and you still want to walk, but like you try and crawl and then you fall over and then finally you get the crawl down and then you try and walk and you fall and you hit your head on the table and then you get up again, you fall down again. And it's not like, you know, our parents are like, oh, forget it. Like he's hopeless. He's never going to be a walker. They're just like every time they take one more step or half a step more than they did before. It's like, oh, my God, this is so amazing. We have to go back to that. We have to go back to knowing that, you know, finding your passion may mean being bad at something first. But go back to this is how it works. You're going to fall over. You're going to suck at first. But every time you're going to learn something different about how you need to hold your body or what you need to do. And you'll go a little bit further. You'll hang on a little bit longer. Stick with it. You know how to do that. You did that as a baby. Now you walk. Now you run. God knows what else you do. Like you've done it then. We have to be willing to do it again. Why should we suddenly as adults feel that we should be amazing at everything we do when we don't know how to do it? Be ready to start at square one and be focused on how far you get versus how far you have to go and get excited about the process because you may just find your passion in that. The other thing I would say with that, too, is like I, growing up, I love PE. I loved it. And I did it all through college because I loved it. Like every now and then I tried to skip a semester or a quarter and I wouldn't do it. And I'd be like, why did I not do that? And I just love PE. And, and as an adult, I also loved art and creating. And so as an adult, you know, I'm trying to like, how do I get more of these things? You know, an hour was not enough PE for me. So why is it so hard to go get an hour of PE now? I know I love it. I know I'm going to have a great time. And the same thing with whether it's writing or editing or painting or draw, whatever it's going to be, right? Some kind of creative endeavor. If I do that every day, I invariably feel better at the end of the day. It's, it's just amazing by just doing those things that you've always known that you love in an adult form of it, whatever it is. It's just this rewards just laying on the ground. All you got to do is go bend over and pick them up. And just go do the thing yeah. that you love to do. So my question to all of you is what makes you feel alive? What fills you with energy? Think back, even if it's been a long time, like think back to your childhood. What were the things that really like, you know, made you happy and filled you with joy? Like go do those things or go, go do something that makes you feel alive. Like do that for you every single day. And what you'll find is that everything starts, you know, if you're in a dark time, everything starts looking a little more hopeful, but you've got to do the things that make you feel alive. Like you swimming, Pete, if you've been out of the pool for a while, it's time to get back in. Right? Because you know yep. it brings you joy. You know it makes you feel great. Do that for you. I love it. What are you working on now? I mean, you got enough things going on, but what's uh, what's coming up next? What's on the horizon? So what's next? Well, my book is being released on June 20th, and I'm so incredibly excited about that. Now that we are settled in here in California, we are going to start running our equine assisted healing events. Um, and I also have a documentary coming out sometime this year, and I'm super, super excited about that because I know that all these things, the book, the documentary, um, the coaching that I do, that it's all making a difference in some small way uh, with each life that I can touch, um, my purpose is being served, and that's all I care about, really. So I'm just, you know going to live life to the full and try and make a beautiful difference and be a light in this world. But I would love to share with everyone listening. If you text go first, G O F I R S T text that to six, six, eight, six, six, you will get a free chapter of my book, finding a way, taking the impossible and making it possible. And I want to share that with you. So just um, text go first to 66866. You'll get a free 
I think it's a free chapter, a free two, two free chapters. And I would love to share that with you. So, um, and Pete, I'm going to be at the Grove in LA on July 27th at okay. 7 p.m. signing books, reading a couple chapters. I'd love to meet you in person and everyone listening here, I would love to connect with you. And those of you that want to experience some horse healing, uh, connect with Pete. And I want to get a group out here to serve and uh, give the gift of these beautiful horses to each and every one of you. I love it. I will be on the road doing the ride for the brave and I'll put the link for that on the 27th. However, I drive north to Benicia all the time or to my, my dad's side of the family in Capitola. And so I scooch right on by and I'll definitely find a time to pop in and, uh, and check in on you ladies, because you know, it's the, what you're doing is amazing. And I want to connect into the veteran network so that we can all support one another, supporting one another. Please. That would be amazing. And, uh, just connect us and we'll do the rest. I love it. All right, stand by. I'm going to run these credits and I'll be right back to you. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curious